Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Um, thanks for making, put, turning your lights on so you can make it through the smoke that's coming. So we appreciate that. Uh, presenting sponsors are very important, but so is my name to those of you that don't know who to blame for today. Okay, I am Lynn Snodgrass, the CEO of the Gresham Chamber of Commerce, and I am delighted that you're here. And if you look around, some of your familiar faces that you typically see aren't here, and all of them are on vacation, in the smoke, in tents, in outhouses, so don't feel a bit sorry for them, or don't wish that you were where they were. Not true, they're not all camping, but... Portland General Electric is a presenting sponsor, and we really appreciate them. We also have Gresham Barlow School District. Dr. Um, Catrice Pereira um, expressed her disappointment. She couldn't join us today. They are a stakeholder sponsor. Metro East Community Media, thank you, Keith, for being here today. We have replay schedules on the registration desk so that you can see again what what you heard today, and you can tell your friends. So on the way out, be sure and pick one of these up um, as well. And Everybody's thinking, okay, you didn't introduce Riverview Community Bank, who is also a presenting sponsor, and that's because I want to take just a little bit of time to talk about Larry. Have you seen, have you seen the movie Father of the Bride? You're looking at Father of the Bride. Um, Larry's daughter is getting married on Monday. Her name is Rochelle, and he just found out that Right next door to where the wedding is, they evacuated everybody because of the potential fire. So keep him in your thoughts, and we'll have, I'm sure, some amazing fun stories that only Larry can tell about that. But Larry, thank you for being here, and thank you. Um, please pass on to Riverview Community Bank um, our appreciation for you being a sponsor. I was going to um, introduce the chamber board member, who is sitting right there, his name is Warner Allen, but he's, um, he's out of the area right now, so I'll come back to that. So it's time for you to hold on to your hats and start gathering facts, because it's campaign season. You can also do this if you want to, but holding on to your hats is what I would prefer that you do. Candidates are revving up their campaigns. In fact, today Mayor Bemis is, is Mayor Bemis's birthday, and for his birthday, he is celebrating his birthday by having a kickoff campaign um, in the form of a barbecue at Main City Park. So all the candidates are taking a look at how they can take full advantage of friends and family, and the mayor happens to have a birthday today and is doing it that way, but issues are shaping up as well. Measure 102, 103, 104, the Metro Housing Bond, gross receipts tax in Portland, and the list goes on. Our goal as a chamber is to provide you with facts. My opinion is that if you arm yourselves with facts, you can make a much better decision. Everything you hear on TV and on the radio, there's a partial bit of truth to it. Absolutely. So the more you dive into the more facts, the better informed you are as a voter and also as a spokesperson for whatever side you're talking about. Today's topic obviously is of interest to you or you wouldn't be here. Dave, is this going to be on the ballot? It's going to be back to the legislature. So you can rest that you won't have to vote on this one, but you need to arm yourselves with facts because you will be hearing more about it. So in order for us to get our program started, what I'd like to do now is to introduce the chair of the Government Affairs Council, Brian Lester, who is the owner and president of PDG Construction Services. Brian? Clap longer. I'll walk slower for that. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm glad you all came. Uh, we have an interesting topic today, and it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Dave Hunt, who is a man with extensive experience in both the public and private sector. Uh, he began his career as a congressional staffer and went on to serve five terms in the Oregon legislature, which is amazing because he only looks like he's about 35, <clears throat> uh, serving as both Speaker of the House uh, and Democratic Majority Leader. He has served as the Executive Director for three nonprofit associations and is currently the Senior Vice President 
uh, Government Affairs with Strategies 360. <clears throat> I had to do a little research on what that is. Strategies 360 provides integrated services and communications, research, government relations, public affairs, marketing, and advertising. They have offices in 12 western states, including Alaska and Hawaii, uh, plus Washington, D.C. So they have a very broad footprint and a wide perspective on a lot of different issues. <clears throat> Dave graduated from high school in Eugene. I don't know if there was north or south Eugene. Sheldon. Sheldon. Oh, I got bad information, I'm sorry. <clears throat> but actually, he flew the duck nest, landing at Columbia University, where he majored in political science and American government. Uh, Dave is also a for me former member of the Oregon City uh, school board, and currently, I just learned, a board a member of Clackamas Community College. Today's topic is one that concerns our health and our pocketbooks. Prescription drug price transparency. Will it bring prices down? Please welcome Dave Hunt to shed some light on this topic. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. This prescription drugs is definitely, you know, I think when you look at public policy issues, a lot of times there are some issues you know a lot about that you feel like directly impact you and some issues that, that uh, you feel like, well, you know, that's an interesting issue, but that really doesn't have imp any impact on me or my family or my business. Prescription drug prices, I mean, how many of you have taken a prescription drug? Raise your hand. Anyone who hasn't, yeah, it's, uh, it impacts all of us and the price, the prices of it, the costs of it definitely impact all of us because uh, prescription drugs, if you look at healthcare costs, prescription drugs are the fastest growing component of healthcare costs. And so whether you're looking at your own healthcare, whether you're looking at your business's healthcare, whether you're looking at the public costs, that we pay on for things, I mean, Senator Monis Anderson has to balance budgets for the Department of Corrections, for public employees, for the, the Oregon Educator Benefit Board. It impacts all across public budgets dramatically. So the, the real focus of the coalition I represent, uh, which is Oregonians for Affordable Drug Prices, which is a whole group, and you can see some of the logos on the back of the sheet on your flyer, a whole group of consumer groups like AARP, hospitals, health plans, doctors and nurses, who, who frankly disagree, and Senator Monis Anderson can attest, fight with each other actively on lots of issues. Uh, they've all come together and said, we've got to address these dramatically rising prescription drug costs because they are, they're killing businesses, they're killing consumers, and they're, they're killing public budgets. And so uh, the coalition formed two years ago uh, in the 2018 legislative session. And again, the other side of the, the sheet <clears throat> will tell you a little bit about House Bill 4005, uh, which was passed by the legislature during the February session and is now in the process. In fact, there, the task force that was set up by that is actually meeting today. It did two things. It uh, s said any pharmaceutical manufacturer that increased the cost of a, of a drug more than 10% in a year has to basically show their math to the state. They have to, to, the state doesn't have the ability to say no to increases above 10%, but if they want to increase a drug above 10% a year, they have to say, here's, here's the R&D costs we're dealing with, here's what we're spending on marketing, here's basically you know, show, showing their math, and that information then is public. It's public to health plans, it's public to consumers, it's public to businesses, it's public to, uh, to elected officials. So that, that is one thing it did. The second thing it did is set up a task force, which is the one that's meeting today, which is really broadly representative of everybody from pharmaceutical manufacturers to consumer groups and every entity in between, pharmacists, uh, physicians, ph pharmacy benefit managers, uh, hospitals, every insurance companies, the whole spectrum to look at what more can be done around price transparency. Because a lot of times, sunshine has a powerful impact of uh, shining a light and, uh, and having a beneficial impact. But in addition to the work that they're doing, more also needs to be done uh, directly. I will say on House Bill 4005, it's one of those great bills in the legislature 
that despite really active advocacy against it by pharmaceutical manufacturers, uh, in fact, you're going to be surprised by the fact that uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers actually had 45 lobbyists advocating against it in Salem. Now, 45 lobbyists on any issue is a huge number in Salem. That's like Washington, D.C. kind of numbers. Uh, despite that fact, the bill passed, and it passed with really broad bipartisan support. Uh, the chief co-sponsors were uh, Senator Linthicum from K Falls, who's a Republican, Senator Steiner Hayward from Beaverton, who's a Democrat, uh, Senator Ron Noble from McMinnville, who's a Republican, uh, Senator, or excuse me, Representative Rob Nose from, uh, from Portland, who's a Democrat. So bipartisan, bicameral, the final, final Senate vote was 25 to 4. Uh, so on the controversial issues that have 45 lobbyists arguing against it, you rarely see a vote of 25 to 4 on the Senate floor. Is that fair, Senator Ron Sanderson? Uh, and yet, people have been impacted by it. Legislators, their staff, their families, their constituents, their neighbors are impacted by these dramatically rising costs. So that's why we think we've got a real opportunity to build on the success of House Bill 4005 and keep moving forward. These same logos I won't highlight because they're the same ones that are on the back of the sheet on your table. Uh, a couple, couple facts that may be helpful of putting, putting this, these issues in context. Uh, last year, pharmaceutical uh, companies increased drug prices at 10 times the rate of inflation. Now, when you start off with that as a fact, we were just talking about the, uh, the increase in construction prices. What, what would you say the, the rate of uh, inflation in construction prices is maybe three times inflation? Two times inflation? 12, 13%. Okay. Year, so. so probably three or maybe even four times inflation. And that's crazy. The rate of construction, I mean, we were just talking about the, the negative impact that has on potential construction. And that's only three or four times inflation. This is 10 times the rate of inflation. So you can see, you can see that uh, we've got a, a system that, it, that is really broken. And again, it doesn't just impact just consumers, but it really impacts all the payers. And whether you're a business owner paying it or whether you're just a taxpayer paying for the public costs of that, uh, we're, all, we're all paying for it. This is an interesting fact that, uh, that the U.S. has the highest uh, spending on pharmaceuticals at uh, a little less than $1,500 a person. If you compare that to second place is Switzerland, which I have no idea why that is true. That's kind of odd. But they're all the way down at $939. The average of the 11 most prosperous uh, countries is $749. So th it's definitely one of those areas where U.S. consumers and all the payers are paying a way disproportionate share of the costs. And that's true whether it's a U.S. manufactured pharmaceutical, a foreign uh, manufactured pharmaceutical, it, that, that really doesn't matter. Uh, so we've got some dramatically uh, high costs nationally. Uh, where are the profits? One of the things the task force that's meeting today in Salem has been looked at at their last meeting was, if you look at all the costs, if you think about the pharmaceutical supply chain, so from the manufacturer through every element of, of, of wholesaler, retailer, uh, insurance company, pharmacy benefit manager, uh, pharmacy, every, the, the whole spectrum of the supply chain, uh, two-thirds of the costs is, is with the pharmaceutical manufacturer. So even if you eliminated the entire rest of the supply chain, you'd still be left with the two-thirds of the cost, which you, you, can't, you can't make up. Uh, this actually gives you a flavor. Well, let's see. This gives you a flavor. I realize that the font is really small, but this, the top line is pharmaceutical manufacturers. This compares it not just within the pharmaceutical supply chain, but to some other industries, and in terms of, uh, of what their, comp their comparable net margins are. This top one is pharmaceutical brand name manufacturers, and the fourth one down is pharmaceutical generic manufacturers. So you've got, uh, you know, tobacco. The net margins are really high in tobacco. I mean, that's a great industry, not from a healthcare standpoint, but from a profit standpoint, that's a great industry. Pharmaceutical manufacturers are even outperforming the net profits of, uh, of tobacco. Um, you can, but you can kind of get a flavor of a wide variety of, uh, of different. I mean, interestingly, the other end of the spectrum, uh, food and drug wholesalers vary 
low comparably debt margins. So the, the, the challenge, I mean, we, we believe, our coalition believes that there are changes that can be made at various levels of the pharmaceutical supply chain, but go where the money is. I mean, that, that's, where, that's where you can really get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of driving down and holding down costs overall. We're also, we've hit a place where those, uh, those price increases are unsustainable. Uh, not only uh, is prescription spending 20% now of the total cost of healthcare, that has grown dramatically over, over the last several years. And as I mentioned earlier, it is now the fastest growing component of healthcare costs. So we've got uh, dramatic increases, 10 times inflation, and then the fact that it's taking up a larger and larger percentage and, and is, is, is driving up healthcare costs. There are several other facts up there um, that, that kind of help put it in, pers in perspective. Uh, overall spending in the U.S. on prescription drugs increased by 13.1%. It's not that there are 13% more people taking prescriptions. It's that of the people taking and needing prescriptions that, uh, that we're just having to pay a lot more for those. Uh, again, uh, almost a 31% increase in spending on specialty meds. Um, that, I think it may be, well, actually th this, this last point is, gives you a good sense of the impact on the public costs. Um, although medical inflation is capped at 3.4% for OHP, the Public Employees Benefit Board and the Oregon Ed Educators Benefit Board, which covers almost all school employees, uh, when you've got these kind of cost increases on prescription drugs, that just means that other factors in healthcare have to be pushed down or out and so we're not, I mean, it's both ballooning budgets, but where budgets are capped, it's pushing other important components of healthcare out of those budgets. And that's not good for, uh, that's not good for people's bottom line. It's also not good for, uh, for healthcare. This, I think, is the most informative chart for me. This compares prices of drugs in the US and in Canada. So if the print is too small for you, this first column is US prices, the second is Canadian prices. It picks about 10 name brand specific drugs. And what, they, what the, the starting list price is for those drugs in the US. Uh, so for instance, uh, I'm not familiar with this first one. Ad oh, that's the, C the first one is COPD. So Advair Discus, $9.52 in the US, $3.96 in Canada. So about two and a half times the cost in the US. Uh, as you go down elsewhere on the chart, you'll start to see larger percentages um, but I mean, you, this, this bottom one here is Arelto, twelve forty four in the U.S., two eleven in Canada, so almost six times the cost. Now I wish I could say the U.S. Canada comparison is an isolated weird incident, but if you put every other country in the world up, they're almost all similar to the Canadian numbers. The reason we compare to Canada is because if you look at the drug safety costs, or not costs at the drug safety regulations between the US and Canada, because that's an important thing. We don't want drugs that are cheap that aren't regulated in terms of safety. The US and Canada have very similar methodology in terms of, uh, in terms of safety regulations. So that's why, as opposed to picking some other countries, we, we often look at the, the comparisons between the US and Canada, because you've got good apples to apples in terms of consumers, you have good apples to apples in terms of in terms of the safety regulations that have gone into the process. But the, I mean, you can see by this chart, and the list could be much, much longer. These are just some random, well-used drugs in the US and Canada. On, on drug after drug after drug, the American uh, taxpayers and American consumers are subsidizing drugs in other countries. Which, if you think about it, is just such a crazy, crazy situation, because it's not like, uh, Canadian, it's not like Canada is some poor country that needs us to subsidize the cost of their drug costs. I mean, the, their economy, uh, in terms of standard of living, is very, very comparable to the U.S., and yet they have access to, uh, to because they, frankly, as a country, regulate what they are willing to pay for costs. And that is something that we as a country do not do. Uh, it really, it, although, that is, although we have two different healthcare systems, the, the drug price regulatory component really could work in any kind of a system. It could work in a more socialized medicine system. It could work in a very completely free market system. 
but but we, we've clearly got a problem where the exact same drug that could be manufactured in the U.S. by one of these companies is going to a U.S. consumer at one price and a Canadian and other country consumer at a much lesser price. This this has got to be this has got to be uh, got to be fixed. And it's also important to say. It's not like the drug companies are just being generous and giving these drugs to Canadians and losing money on it. They're making profit still in this column. So that, I mean, it's still a good business uh, for pharmaceutical manufacturers in that last column. Um, that is just a much, much better deal if they can charge three, four, five, six times the cost to, uh, to U.S. consumers. Uh, this is one, uh, one sample. Uh, uh, consumer from actually from Newport, Oregon. Uh, she looks kind of angry, and she is kind of angry, because uh, her insulin, which is manufactured in California, costs about a third of the price in Canada than it does at her pharmacy down the street in Newport. So if she went to Canada, bought the same drug, it'd be one third of the cost that she has to pay in Newport. Again, that's not that's not fair to American consumers. It's not fair to uh, American taxpayers. Um, so in terms of solutions looking forward, I mentioned the work of the, of, the, of the bill, of the law, when House Bill 4005 passed, the work, the continued focus on transparency. One piece of which has already happened in terms of the reporting of price increases above 10% a year. Others of which is, is going to, that, that task force has to report back to Senator Monner Anderson and the legislature uh, for the 2019 session with some other ideas around transparency. But they've got a, a specific narrow focus just on transparency for the entire ph pharmaceutical supply chain. Our coalition is now looking at other proposals to give to Senator Monis Anderson and the, and the rest of her legislative colleagues that would uh, go beyond just transparency to get at some of these uh, at some of these price increases. So I'll give you a sample of a few ideas that have been uh, that have been tried in other states. Um, and the fact I mentioned that we have we had 45 pharmaceutical lobbyists in the state capitol that is replicated unfortunately across every state capitol, and um, there are uh, so many of these proposals in other states have been killed. This is one issue where Oregon is actually ahead of the curve. I'm sorry to say, as far behind as we are, we're ahead of the curve. Um, but but there have been a couple things that have um, been uh, pursued in other states. Uh, the first is actually a commission to review drug costs. Um, Lynn mentioned uh, PGE is one of the sponsors of uh, the chamber and the lunch. PGE for our energy costs and all the other energy companies has to go through a very similar kind of commission for energy costs in Oregon. They propose what they think the price increases should be. They basically make a justification and there's a state commission that looks at that and in some cases says, they say, yep, that seems justified. You increase your prices to that that uh, level. In other cases, they say no. Based on the the math you've shown us, we don't think that pencils out. You can only increase up to a certain percentage. And so that's actually, I mean, that's worked for a lot of years in Oregon. I bet it was very controversial. Uh, that, did that pass before your time in the legislature? Like about 100 years. Uh, it was that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when it passed, but I bet it was I'm wildly. <laughs> Sorry, Speaker Snodgrass. Uh, but I bet that was very controversial uh, when it passed. But now we just kind of take it, take it for granted. We have actually a similar, uh, different uh, agency that administers a commission for health insurance costs. Health insurance companies come in, propose um, cost increases. And um, in some cases, they're approved. In other cases, they're told, uh, no, you can only increase to a certain level. So the idea of a commission would be similar to those. It has not been tried in any state yet. There's a similar system in Canada. That one has not been tried in any state yet. It actually passed one chamber in Maryland this year, uh, but didn't make it through the, the other chamber. Um, but that, that is one idea that's been pursued because it's been tried in, in non-pharmaceutical non areas, both in healthcare and outside, of a, of, a, of a possible way to keep down costs. Another proposal is lifting the gag rule on pharmacies. And this, I don't think, is as much of an issue in Oregon as it is some places, but there, in some cases there are pharmacy benefit managers who negotiate with a pharmacy. They have contracts with a pharmacy. And they put a clause in there saying to the pharmacists, you may not tell consumers about cheaper ways to pursue. So if I have a particular health insurance, I go in to fill it. The copay is $50. The pharmacist may know 
that if I paid for it directly, it'd only be $30. The pharmacist in those systems is not allowed to tell me because they have a gag rule as part of their contract with the pharmacy benefit manager. So another proposal is to say to PBMs, you may not put those in your contract. You may not tie the hands and gag the voices of, pharma of pharmacists who are trying to give information to consumers. Again, that's, that's not as probably as big of an impact, but, but may be worth uh, pursuing. Uh, importation from Canada, the state of Vermont actually just passed that this spring. Um, they have a Democratic legislature, Republican governor. They said, we as a state are going to become, you, they, they saw that slide I showed you earlier about drug prices in Canada, said we want those prices, so we as a state are gonna start importing drugs from Canada. And uh, they, they have, there's some specific language in there about, about making sure the, that it only happens, the reason they chose just Canada is because of those health and safety regulations I mentioned earlier. Um, but that's another proposal that does require approval from the federal uh, Health and Human Services Agency. And although President Trump talked a lot about that during the campaign, his Health and Human Services Secretary comes from the pharmaceutical industry, so it's unclear about whether or not he will approve that. Uh, but that definitely would have some beneficial impact, especially if several states got together and did it collectively. So that, that's an idea that at least one state has passed. Uh, I mentioned additional additional uh, transparency. One of the other ideas that kind of falls into the transparency bucket would be a 60-day advance notice that uh, if a pharmaceutical company wants to raise a price, they have to say, we're gonna do it starting in 60 days. Instead of today, they just say, we're doing it. They would have to give 60-day notice. California just passed that last year. And it's amazing, it's already had a beneficial impact just in the last few months because several pharmaceutical manufacturers who said, we plan to increase our prices by X on this whole series of drugs. Once that 60 day notice went into effect and the plans and the health insurance companies and the consumer groups had time, <clears throat> excuse me, had time to organize around it, time to look for alternatives, all of a sudden they rolled back the proposed price increases. So that's actually had a more beneficial impact than even I would have guessed in, uh, to our, in our neighbor to the south. Um, there are some proposals around uh, making advocacy groups disclose where their funding comes from. So you'll see some groups, and actually we have had two of them in Oregon now, uh, which are pretending to be patient groups, but which really are funded by the pharmaceutical industry and really don't have any patients. It's not like AARP where there are actually a whole bunch of seniors who are members. Uh, so just disclosure, Sunshine may be a way to, uh, to look at, at that. Uh, a, reassur a reinsurance program that would create a, a way to subsidize some of the, um, the cost of drugs is another proposal. And uh, this last one is a new one we're looking at that's, that's been, been looked at in a few other states. There is so much money that goes into advertising of, of drugs. I mean, you see it anytime you turn on the TV, I think they're just some of the most comical ads now because they say, you know, drug X will solve every problem in your life. And then the fine print that's the last half of the ad is, you know, may cause dismemberment or death or a whole variety of other things. Um, but they spend a lot on advertising. They're also now advertising on electronic health records. So when your medical provider pulls up your electronic health record in, in, uh, in the, your medical office, uh, they're getting advertising from pharmaceutical manufacturers. So one of the other proposals is, uh, is to ban that advertising. Um, probably for self-explanatory reasons, but because your, your doctor or your nurse that's prescribing, presumably is prescribing because that is what you need and that's gonna be the most effective uh, tool for you, not because of some advertisement that uh, they've gotten. So a variety of solutions. I mean, our coalition I think is really open to what's going to work the best and in, in terms of driving down costs and, and what's gonna be a good fit for Oregon. But this, this kind of gives you a, a list of several ideas that are uh, being pursued. So how can you all engage? Uh, collectively, we would love to have uh, the Gresham Chamber uh, become a member of our coalition, both to uh, help weigh in as we're evaluating those possible proposals that were on the previous slide, and, uh, and help us decide which are gonna be the best ones for your members, but also then to join in advocating uh, with the legislature so we have uh, even a broader voice than the 20 or so groups that are part of us right now. Individually, we love to hear individual stories, as tragic as they sometimes are. Uh, I was actually just, in fact, I just had a meeting uh, 
in Salem with uh, a brand new legislative candidate who's running for the legislature, and her staff person told a story, this is just this morning, um, told a story about her, her dog and her boyfriend both are on the same medication. <laughs> and they, the cost differential is ridiculous. The, dog, the cost of the dog's medication, it's literally the exact same medication. She's getting me documentation. I'm looking forward to seeing this. But the dog's medication is a dramatically lesser cost than her human boyfriend's medication. And uh, that's, that's crazy. Uh, but there are lots of examples of where consumers are being gouged, where businesses and public employers are, are having to pay far too much. So we love to hear those stories. Uh, you can talk to me today uh, after the lunch is done or contact us through one of these, uh, these venues. But also be in contact with your legislators. I mean, I think they, I think Senator Montes Anderson and uh, Speaker Snodgrass would be the first to say, hearing individualized stories from constituents is the most effective way to, uh, to persuade legislators uh, that there's a problem and that they need to act on solutions. And so we, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and be happy to take any questions or suggestions you may have. Yeah. I've always got suggestions. But I do want to recognize David uh, kept pointing over here and I didn't introduce Senator Monis Anderson, but I am going to now. <clears throat> oh, no, I do need to. So, Senator, what committee did you chair this last session? Okay, I chaired the Senate Health Care Committee. <laughs> so she knows a lot about it. Um, how long have you been in the health care industry? Uh, going on 40 years. So we're, we're talking expert um, in our midst. Was this, um, was the bill, was it 4005? 4005, mm -hmm. 4005, a controversial bill during the session, do you remember? It is extremely controversial. Dave is right on uh, when he states that you have lobbyists. And of course, being chair of the Senate Health Care Committee, I truly do like to meet with most of the lobby. But at, towards the end, I was saying, staff, you meet with the lobby. I'm getting tired of the same story over and over again. Yeah, and it's important to note that what Dave said is that there are stories that impact a legislator. But the stories come from the lobbyists as well. They have constituents that are telling stories too. So it's really important. Did you learn anything new from what Dave said today? No, I wasn't aware of all of the new um, proposals. So mm -hmm. that's really exciting to see. I, I, I'd heard about the Canada being able to um, have have our next door neighbors supply some of those meds to us, um, but the others I hadn't, so I was really pleased. Well, Senator, thanks for taking the time to be here. Um, Senator Anderson, did, Senator, Senator Bonas Anderson can't always come because she has lots of other responsibilities, so I appreciate you taking the time. So I wanna go over here and then we're gonna start with questions. What we have amongst us is somebody who drives up to Canada on occasion because he's got dual citizenships and he brings a carload of drugs back and that's how he <laughs> makes his retirement. He just fills that puppy up and backseat, tra a trailer, the U-Haul comes around. So it looks like you're out of a job, Bob. Hey, I have dual citizenship, remember? <laughs> There we go. Just kidding. But I think that Bob, I know, I, know, I know I do that. But I think it's interesting to note that um, Bob probably sees this in real life because he does have dual citizenship and he did just come back from a trip to, from his other home about three weeks ago, maybe? Uh, yeah, about three weeks ago. Okay, now it's time for questions. Okay, well, I've done the serious stuff and the humor stuff. So now, Betty, you had a question? Here we go. And then Leslie, are you next? First, one for, oh, thanks, one for Senator Monis Anderson. So what do the lobbyists say to you? What are their stories? How do they justify these facts and figures? Uh, I, I can't go into everyone, but they're, they're very skilled. There's a lot of training that these lobbyists have um, paid for by their, um, um, by the pharmaceutical manufacturers and they have the stats and the numbers and you can make stats and numbers say anything that you want it to believe or want the other person to believe. So. And, and I can give you one example of the arguments made on the other side against this bill is uh, that if we restrict costs down to somewhere closer to inflation, 
that will eliminate the ability of pharmaceutical companies to be, uh, to have ingenuity and do R&D and that R research and development is expensive in developing new uh, life-saving drugs. And that's actually a great argument. The, the challenge with the argument is if those are the costs, then why are they selling the drugs at such a fraction of the costs in every other country? Um, so something, their argument is great. I, would, I mean, that, that's a good argument to have. And having, you know, having, making sure we have uh, creativity and ingenuity in, uh, in the industry is critically important because we want to have the best drugs uh, developed in the world. Uh, the challenge is if we, if they can do that and still sell those drugs to, um, to every other country at a much reduced cost, something, something is wrong. So either, either what they're saying is not accurate or they're making Americans subsidize the rest of the world. And uh, so that's, that's where the argument starts to fade. And there are big salaries, I'm sure. Um, so the other question, you know, I was really concerned with this controversy over the EpiPen, which mm -hmm. is a life-saving device. So many people depend on that. And with the, the way the price has just skyrocketed, I mean, yeah. isn't there some way the government can do some kind of a intervention federally or something when you're talking about something as critical as EpiPens? And, and one of the, I think there's no question the optimal solution would be at the federal level. I, I'd be the first to say having a national solution on this would be optimal. I think if you look at uh, how, I mean, even going back to the Bush administration, how the, uh, the prescription drug uh, Medicare Part D played out, the Obama administration, how the Affordable Care Act played out, and, and currently with, this, with Secretary Azar, you've just seen a consistent you can clearly see the impact of the pharmaceutical industry on DC and in all three of those examples they have not been able to enact real price controls um, of, of any sort. So that, that, I think that's tragic, that's unfortunate, but it does mean that the, the responsibility gets bumped to state capitals to, uh, to be able to do something. Now, I think the reason that pharmaceutical manufacturers are trying to stomp out any ideas wherever they pop up is if something good happens in California or Oregon or Vermont or Maryland or wherever, it has a way of spreading because of the a state said, well, wait a second, they did it. They are still having access to life-saving medications and their prices are going down. We should try that. And so I think that's, that's where we've got both a challenge and an opportunity right now to, to be creative at the state level. Um, thanks so much for your presentation. My name is Leslie Parker and I'm a health insurance agent. I do group individual Medicare. Okay. So on your solutions, the one thing I saw um, was on the Canadian opportunity. One thing that's important on the Canadian opportunity is if there were a ability for the insurance companies to participate to allow the Canadian drugs to actually be part of the plan. Mm. Because right now, mm -hmm. if I purchase the drugs, I can get a lower price, but I still have to pay for it 100% out of pocket. It doesn't show up on my plan as an expense. So for people who are taking those medications, having the ability for those charges to be collated into the plan would be a big win. And so could that be done at the state level or would that have to happen federally? You, uh, because it's a plan management issue, you could do it at the state level. Hmm. Okay. Thanks, good and suggestion. it was a Gresham idea. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other thing I see is that there are certain, and one you saw in the top was the Advair. Oh, it's, it's hang on, sorry, but Canada. One of the things about Canada that also creates a problem is that uh, new drugs they can't sell across border. There's usually some kind of uh, procedure, so that becomes a problem. And the other thing is they can't sell anything that's temperature sensitive across mm. the border. So um, that begins to, some of these drugs, which are very common, create a barrier to get access to those lower costs. Because um, there are pharmacists in Canada that will ship to your location right. for, so you don't have to drive. So that's a great resource. Um, so that's something. And then the other thing that I see is that there are certain conditions. One of them is diabetes. Another one is COPD. Um, and what I've seen over the number of years is that the, to their credit, the pharmaceutical industry has provided some wonderful medications to create great living 
for many, many years with some very serious illnesses. Absolutely. But what that does is that they have maybe three, four, five medications that they have to take to maintain that level mm -hmm. of health. And those four or five medications begin to spend to a dollar that they find very difficult to afford long term. So maybe if it was more on a disease management perspective from a cost control than just on the drug, but to look at it from a disease management. That's great. Great suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Another question? Yes, Ruth. Thanks so much. Ruth Adkins with Kaiser Permanente, proud member of the coalition. Yep. So thanks so much for being here. Um, just wondering if you had any comments. I know that's not nothing's on the ballot, but just in terms of how this issue, given how um, hotly contested it was in the building, um, how this might be playing out in terms of the governor's race or other, um, other candidates for this uh, in the in November election. Yeah, great, great question. And, and the politics of this are interesting because if you look at, at polling on this, um, in, in fact, probably the best example is uh, this bill, it, it, it came from the House Health Committee down to the, Ways and, the Joint Ways and Means Committee, the Budget Committee, because it had a budgetary impact um, on 4005, um, because it was ch it's charging pharmaceutical companies fees in order to pay for the, the cost of the regulatory process. So no net cost, but it had a budget cost. In the Ways and Means Committee, there were three three senators who voted no on the bill, just because I think instinctively their, their, their first instinct was, ah, this is kind of a regulatory burden, no. Within, so that bill was on the Senate floor two days later. Those legislators heard from so many constituents that all three of them flipped their vote from no to yes in those two days on the uh, Senate floor. In fact, there was even one senator who was, I think he was the first one to ring in for a debate on the bill and gave a speech against the bill. By the end of the debate, even he had voted yes on the bill. And it was, none of those were your senator, I will say. Um, but but I think, I think it, it does have a resonance with the public. There are not a lot of, as, as both Lynn and Lori can say, there are not a lot of issues in, in public life that are 90-10 issues. You know, there are a lot of 60-40 issues, 51-49 issues. This is one of those issues where the average consumer, the average business owner, the average person on the street just gets it. And the more communications there are in the legislature, I think that's why we saw such an overwhelming lopsided bipartisan <laughs> bicameral vote. Um, so, you know, we haven't talked about pursuing anything as a ballot measure. Uh, and part of that is I think a lot of us, um, I won't say are not big fans of the ballot measure process, but it, it's an inart, it's kind of a blunt instrument because you can't continue to have hearings and amend and refine and, and reform an idea. And so that's why we continue to pursue things through the legislative process. But I, I think there, I mean, perhaps some of the harder ideas uh, might be valid ballot measures in the future. Definitely not on the 2018 ballot though. Dave, could you put the chart up of the, the ideas that you've got? That one, mission, yeah. Um, before I go on to another question, do you have a goal of how many of those or which one of those you want to pursue? Because it looks to me like this is a, a piece, of, a slice of the loaf, not a whole yeah. piece of, you know, not a whole loaf of For bread sure. kind of issue as you yeah. move through. Do you have some ideas of uh, something that you think might work pretty easily or will have a really big impact to add on to 4,005? I, and, and un, well, and it is often true in public life, the ones that would potentially have the biggest impact, like the commission to review drug costs, are probably the biggest lift to happen. Mm -hmm. um, whereas like the lifting the gag rule, the second one, lifting the gag rule on pharmacies, is probably the easiest one of this list. Okay. And at least potentially in Oregon probably has the most limited impact because a lot of our pharmacy benefit managers don't insert that in their contracts. So we're trying to find that balance. I mean, it would be, it would be completely unfair for us to come in to the healthcare committees and the legislature and say, we would like you to pass all seven of these ideas plus the uh, transparency proposals from the task force. So I, I think as we're in conversation with, you know, with our coalition members, uh, we're, we're looking at that balance of what is doable and is going to make a difference and how do we find that, that happy medium. And so perhaps maybe two or three of these items at the most would be on our agenda for 2019. 
we're not going to bring in. We're not going to bring in seven proposals. Okay, which unless, is unless you want them, Senator Montes Anderson. No. <laughs> well, um, yeah. I, yeah, there's, there's some heavy lifting as a chairperson, too. Yeah. But she not only has to listen to the lobbyists on both sides of the yeah. issue, but she also has to listen to her committee members as well to see where they're, where they're going to line up and balance. So another question? OK. Is your phone off? <laughs> it is. So how much is the coalition uh, working with other states on their solutions and how much of an interplay is available there? Yeah, great, great question. And actually, we, there are a group of other states that we have had regular phone calls with to share what they have found success in, what they're finding challenge in, and, and, and we're sharing the same information from here. So there are several other states, not all of them, but there are several other states that have a pretty good geographic cross-section um, across the whole country that are, that are sharing information. Because, now, I, I will, as I said earlier, uh, this is one of those issues where as, as challenging as action has been in Oregon, we are actually ahead of the curve overall. Um, but there are, there are a few other states that have passed, I mean, like, like I mentioned, that have passed the gag rule, that have passed uh, importation from Canada, that have passed the 60-day notice. So there are a few other states that have tried some different things. Um, they haven't passed our transparency bill, uh, but, but we're, we are sharing information. Because the, the, the ideal situation is we can learn from their successes and they can learn from ours. And again, Hopefully, it all leads into a national solution because that is really what is, is is being cried out for, is an ultimate national solution. But one of the best ways to get to a national solution is have states be creative and demonstrate success, and then have that spread across the country and ultimately be enacted nationally. M much like at the state level, a lot of times local governments will will come up with a good idea and pass something and uh, then propose it at the state level. That's the way it's supposed to work. Oh, yep. Know that. <laughs> Another question? Yes, sir. He, he just asked how many states are involved. I think in oh. our group there are, there are seven or eight that we're in regular contact with. Are they all on the West Coast? No. Nope. In fact, Washington is actually not even a part of it. Although we actually, they did call us right after the legislature passed transparency because they immediately introduced the same bill in the legislature after the Oregon legislature passed transparency. They introduced the same bill in Olympia. Hey, okay, Richard. Hi there. My question is, uh, on here there's a few uh, uh, pharmaceutical associations that are here, but what about the retailer companies uh, like Walgreens, Rite, Rite Aid, et cetera? Uh, uh, are they involved at all or are they against it at all? Uh, do you, you know? You know, I I just don't think we have reached out to them. I think I think somebody like Walgreens or any pharmacy. I mean, you have the uh, the Oregon Society of Health System Pharmacists. Oh, excuse me, the Oregon State Pharmacy Association includes the Walgreens and the Rite Aids and the the other more name brands. I, I don't think we've asked them individually to add their brand, but that's through their trade association. They're yeah, they're very actively involved and, and completely supportive. They'd probably jump on that gag rule thing so For that sure. they could sure. unleash their um, their staff to do a good thing for their customers. Another question? We're just about done. Going, going. Leslie, okay. Um, you had indicated that the gag rule is not something that you perceive to be an issue. I think it, it definitely is an issue some places. It appears in Oregon, and we're continuing to dig into this, but it appears in Oregon that the number of pharmacy benefit managers that have embedded that in their contracts with pharmacies in Oregon is limited. And so um, I, in your research, yeah. it will be interesting because um, even though they may not be embedded in that, it seems to be a general practice. So, because uh, I deal with people all the time where I tell them to use other tools. Okay. Uh, there's a tool called goodrx.com, and I always develop and say, you must go and look at that tool before you take your benefits to the pharmacy. Hmm. 
and we had a gentleman today, I was at an early morning meeting, and he said, I used the tool, and my benefit was 60, and I found the product for $14. So anyways, that well, level of transparency is a huge need. Yeah. So again, I don't understand the embedded issue of how that's being done, but I see it still in practice. Well, I, I was picking up a couple of prescriptions from our pharmacy. We typically go to Rite Aid, and uh, the, the, the copay, and I think it was a new drug my wife was taking, and the copay was $50, which seemed high to me. And so I asked him, you know, is there an alternative if I just pay for this directly? And and he said, no, this is the cheapest you get. And I said, if there was, would you be allowed to tell me? He said, absolutely. Yeah, we have no hands <laughs> tied on that. So I, I think it, it is a sporadic, unlike some of these other issues which are system-wide, that is a more sporadic, isolated case. Dave, how would people get a hold of you? I don't see it on the brochure here. Should so, I? Yeah, so you can either go to uh, the website is affordablerxnow.org, or you can go onto social media, Affordable Rx Now on Twitter, Oregonians for Affordable Drugs on Facebook, and uh, our, our contact information is on there. You can share. There's a place where you can share your stories. And, or you and, can and contact, contact me, and I can give you his home phone. For sure. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Betty, uh, Betty and Bob? You had mentioned earlier when Lynn was out, you had met. Oh, yeah. You had mentioned, but you'd welcome the Gresham Chamber support yeah. on, on your sheet of sponsors here. Yeah. I, I'm, I don't see any chambers on there that you've mentioned. I'm wondering if you are reaching out to other chambers or through the state chamber for a statewide support from the business community. Yeah. It, it, great, great, thanks for that follow-up. Uh, and actually, we had not reached out to any business associations. Again, the coalition was put together about 18 months ago uh, and really started with groups that were, you know, healthcare and consumer kind of directly related. So about, uh, gosh, probably about two months ago, I reached out to, I think, seven chambers, kind of seven larger chambers across the state. And uh, li actually, Lynn was the very first response I got back immediately, uh, to her credit. And, but we're actually presenting, in fact, actually I just presented to the, uh, the Ben Chambers uh, Advocacy Council, I think they call them. Each chamber calls your process something different, of course. You wouldn't be unique, individualized chambers if that was not true. But I, I just presented by phone to, the, to them, and uh, we have similar presentations set up to the North Clackamas Chamber, the Eugene Area Chamber, the Medford Chamber, the Portland Business Alliance, and there might be one more I'm forgetting. But I hear you talking to all these individual chambers. Yeah. Would it not be more time effective to go to the state chamber office and have that office recommend to the local chambers rather than you running around for 30 or 40 years? So the one challenge, the I, I don't know how else to answer this question without just being laying my cards out on the table. The, uh, the lobbyist for the state chamber also lobbies for a particular pharmaceutical drug. And so I figured that probably was not the best place to start. Uh, in fact, my chamber uh, CEO in the North Clackamas Chamber, Laura Edmonds, uh, I think she still chairs the legislative committee for the state chamber, doesn't she? Or she did. Camera Flora, maybe it still she, maybe. does. She's on the board. Okay. Yeah, she's on the board. So, um, so actually, her her advice was. She said, she said we take positions. We've taken positions in the past that happen to disagree with one of our other lobbyist clients. So don't worry about that. Her her advice was actually to start with mm -hmm. individualized chambers, mm -hmm. grassroots up. Well, and I, and I actually think that it's it's similar grassroots up instead of top down and. Uh, the state chamber takes some pretty careful votes on what won't split up their membership as well. And so I mean, in some chambers, we'll have pharmaceutical companies that are part of their chamber membership mm -hmm. as well. So it's a, I think it's wise to start with the smaller ones. Um, it also helps you fine tune your presentation. Absolutely. And I, I honestly don't think that having JL there, is, if that's who it is, no. would stop them from making a decision, yep, but it would it. be a, a flag that you'd have to overcome. Yep. But you gotta overcome it at some point in time. Absolutely. So um, we're out of time. Betty, did you have a quick question? I was just gonna ask how generic drugs factor into this when you were just talking about in your scenario with your wife. I mean, was there a cheaper version that was generic versus? Yeah. A lot of times are, and actually there's a generics representative on the, the Transparency Task Force, and um, they're, I mean, they're, they're, well, I think one of the biggest challenges that the generics face 
is there seems to be a trend with some of the pharmaceutical manufacturers where you know they will have their patent for the life of the patent and the model was that that would then expire and there would be an opportunity for generics to be out there and be much more widely available at less cost. One of the things that is happening is the, manu the, the brand manufacturer will slightly tweak a drug and rebrand it and it's basically the same so a generic can't go out there because all of a sudden it has a new patent with a new life. So that's a federal issue we can't fix, but that is, that is, that's probably the biggest issue facing generics. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Appreciate the attention and good suggestions. Thank you very much. Yes, Dave is very young. He was just graduating from grade school when I was speaker, so. Well, which goes to the point of the uh, PUD. <laughs> okay, I owe you. Okay, um, Portland General Electric, speaking of PUD, is one of our sponsors, Riverview Community Bank. Larry, good luck Monday. Gresham Barlow School District. Metro East Community Media, don't forget to pick this up if you want to share this information with your friends. This is a great way to do it, to encourage them to go on and uh, listen to the replay. We have some really, not that today wasn't, but we have some really good and hot issues coming up. Next month is the, um, our September BLT is Metro Housing Bond. It, it is going to be a very heated issue and we're going to have both sides of that bond present facts to you. It's not gonna be a debate, but they are going to issue questions or issue information to you so that you can be better equipped to make a decision. Metro Councilor Shirley Craddock will be presenting and Andy Dyke of Affordable Housing will also be here. They'll be sharing the podium respectfully on both sides of that issue. Be sure and pick up your replay schedule. And who bought one of these tickets today? Okay, your dues go up, your dues go up, your dues go up. We're having a contest in my office and my staff sat out there and sold their tickets instead of mine. So I still have some tickets if any of you want your dues to go down. You can buy a raffle ticket from me today. Dave, you need some of these. Okay. Um, we do have a busy week. The golf tournament is Thursday. Thank you so much for coming today. You've been a wonderful, although smaller, but a wonderful group. Dave, thank you for coming all this way. We appreciate you and we appreciate the information you've given us. You're dismissed.